Hi everyone, this is our channel, Meet the Real Story. Please, like, share and subscribe. I don't really like Indian movies, because the actors are always overreacting, and the movies are not logical at all. But this is just my personal opinion. However, I've discovered that there are stories stranger than Indian movies. Let me give you a real-life example. I'll tell you a story about a young woman named Samantha. Samantha was a beautiful girl, with blonde hair and green eyes. She lived with her grandmother, after her parents died in a horrible car accident. The whole country read about it. She had many friends, and all the neighbors liked her. They considered her the most beautiful girl in town. Many had proposed to her, but she didn't care much for them. One day, Samantha was walking alone down the street after visiting one of her friends. Suddenly, she had an eerie feeling that someone was following her. She began running and crying for help. Her follower began running and stopped her. He was an ugly man, pointing a knife in her direction. He asked her to hand over her purse. She threw it at him and made a run for it. The man said wait and made to stop her, but another man appeared out of nowhere and punched the thief who fell unconscious. The brave and good Samaritan picked up Samantha's purse and handed it to her. He was very handsome, with green eyes, soft hair, and an amazing smile. He escorted her back home, and she felt that he was her knight in shining armor. She went inside and hugged her grandmother tight, who was a little surprised but smiled. Samantha was so happy that she gently pulled her grandmother to her feet, and they whirled around and danced playfully. The very next day, she was surprised when she answered the doorbell. Steve, the tall, handsome man, was standing there, holding flowers. He proposed to her, and she said yes. Thus began their love story. Then one day, Samantha was standing in the kitchen preparing dinner. Steve and her grandmother were out, but they were supposed to be back soon. Samantha had everything ready, and she set the table. The house door opened, and Steve walked in. Samantha went to greet him, but she felt dizzy and fainted. Steve quickly took her to the hospital. The doctor congratulated Steve, saying that he was going to be a father. Steve was ecstatic, but Samantha was not. Instead, she was shocked and nervous. She said that she was too young to have kids, that she wasn't ready to be a mother. Steve was taken aback and said, But why? Don't you want him? Things were different from that point on. Samantha tried to get an abortion several times, but Steve was always stopping her. She couldn't accept it. She blamed Steve, but Steve couldn't understand her. In her seventh month of pregnancy, Samantha was with her grandmother at the supermarket when she saw a small boy run onto the road. Fearing he might get run over by a car, Samantha quickly pulled the boy off the road to safety. The boy's mother saw what happened and thanked Samantha, feeling so grateful and relieved. Samantha was crying at the moment and replied, No need to thank me. I'm going to be a mother like you soon. For the first time, she was beginning to feel real affection for the baby. Forgive me, she silently thought to herself. She tried to contact Steve many times to tell him that she had finally accepted. She was ready to become a mother, but he never responded. Finally, the day had come. Samantha went to the hospital to give birth. After the surgery, she was very tired. Nevertheless, when she woke up, she immediately asked for the baby. Her grandmother handed her the child. It was a daughter, and she was so beautiful. The nurse tried to take the baby out of her arms, but Samantha refused, wanting to hold her for as long as she could. The next day, Samantha heard a big commotion, and she had a feeling of dread that something bad had just happened. It was confirmed when she saw her grandmother's face. She asked what had happened, and her grandmother told her that a child was missing and had apparently been kidnapped. Samantha's pale face slowly pleaded, Please don't tell me that it was my daughter. When her grandmother nodded, Samantha broke down and began crying and wailing in pain. The nurses tried to calm her down, and when she did, her grandmother came over to her and handed her a note. It had been found in her missing daughter's hospital crib. It was in Steve's handwriting. It simply said, If you don't want her, I do. Then Samantha fainted. For many years, she tried finding her baby, but couldn't. Steve and her daughter had vanished into thin air. She felt as if time had stopped for her. But Steve didn't feel that way. He raised their daughter into a beautiful young woman. He named her Margot. Whenever Margot asked about her mother, Steve would always tell her that her mother was dead. 
but he often told her stories about her mother and how much he had loved her. Margot's intuition, however, told her that her father wasn't being completely honest with her and that he was hiding some big dark secret. One day, Steve fell ill unexpectedly. He called Margot to him and told her that he was very sick and felt that he was going to die soon. He said that he wanted to reveal a secret that he had long kept from her, that her mother was actually alive and that her name was Samantha. He told her that he had kidnapped her from the hospital at birth because her mother did not want a child. He regretted it and asked Margot to forgive him. He gave her Samantha's address and soon after, he died. After his death, Margot decided to go looking for her mother. I am Margot and I am now standing at my mother's address. At her front door, I cannot predict my mother's reaction when she answers the door and I introduce myself as her daughter, but I'm going to hug her and tell her that I've missed her for so long. Hello, I'm Sarah. Ever heard of a phobia before? Don't worry, it's not contagious or anything. It just means you're scared of something in particular. Places, people, things. I have a phobia, but I don't like to talk about it. And I definitely don't want to be seen in that state. I was in my second year at college. I had been very busy that semester because we had a lot of assignments. And it was fine, I mean, I liked studying and completing tasks. But I was never a nerd or a geek. No. I like to dress nicely too. I have my own fashion and style. It wasn't easy making friends though. There were two types of people at my school. Smart nerds who couldn't care less how they dress and complete airheads who dress nice. I didn't fit in either one of those groups. So I basically kept to myself until one day I got assigned to do a task with a girl and a boy, Jane and Kyle. They didn't look nerdy at all. And I thought to myself, oh great, it looks like I'll be doing all the work. But when we started talking about the project, they didn't just sit there or toss ridiculous retorts. All three of us were having an actual conversation about the topic. I was so thrilled. It finally seemed like I belonged somewhere. We became friends and did everything together. We could tell each other anything. Well, not everything. I had one secret from my friends. I never told them I had a phobia. Anyway, a year later, Jane moved to Germany with her parents. She was going to finish college there. So it was just Kyle and I now. All through college, we were the best of friends. We even did our graduation project together. On graduation day, Kyle and I were supposed to go out for dinner. He wouldn't tell me where, said it was a surprise. And what a surprise it was. He had picked the highest tower in the whole city to eat dinner at the very top. I don't have a problem with high places in particular. In fact, I'm sure I'll love the view if I ever make it to the top. No, I had a problem with the elevator. A phobia, to be precise. So we were standing at the base of the tower and Kyle was happily listing all the great features and restaurants up there, but I didn't hear any of it. I was too busy fretting, frozen to the spot, desperately trying to find a way out of the situation. I couldn't say no to Kyle, who was all excited to go up the tower, so I clenched it in and tried my best to stay calm. We got in the elevator and the doors shut. I couldn't control what came after that. I was terrified, screaming and shouting hysterically, banging on the walls, then falling to the ground. Of course, I don't actually remember any of it. Kyle told me later on. The last thing I remember was the elevator doors shutting close. When I came to, I was at the hospital. Kyle was sitting by my bed looking worried. When he saw that I woke up and that I was feeling fine, he started laughing at me, saying, why didn't you tell me you had a phobia? I felt ridiculous and started laughing too. And then out of nowhere, he proposed. It was his plan all along, although he pictured it at the top of the tower. All that happened three years ago. We're married now and we have a baby girl. I'm being treated for my phobia. It's not completely gone, but I'm way better now. Apparently, hiding my problems never solves them. I'll have to face them, sooner or later. Hello there, my name is Burns. The first day of my professional life was the worst professional day ever. During my first year at college, I wanted to spare my parents some of the expenses. So I took a job, and it happened to be the closest thing I could get to my dream job. It was an office that was mainly concerned with planning fashion shows. I know I was only an intern at the moment, but I have never been so excited in my life. I was actually studying fashion designing, so lucky me. But since we all know that life isn't always pink and roses, I had a repulsive boss. 
Let's call her Jane. I was employee of the month three times in a row. My life couldn't get any better. Well, except for Jane, who almost thought I made her the worst coffee ever, yet she still drinks it. The closest colleague I had at work was a guy named Mark. I also had a tiny little crush on him, but that is not our point here. Anyways, I was supposed to organize a huge event, and so Jane sent an extra long office-wide email giving out details about the event and the brand and who was assigned to do what. I was ecstatic. I was running around the office like a busy bee that had to make sure everything was in place. After a long, tiring day, I was at my desk, rereading the email she sent and enjoying a good cup of coffee. And guess what? Jane had about a gazillion typos, and to be honest, I wanted something to cool me off after doing so much. And being the smart employee that I am, I wanted to crack a good joke and maybe, just maybe, get Mark to laugh. I wrote a sarcastic, full of mockery email, and once I hit send, I heard gasps echoing around the office, and I realized that I had clicked reply all. Jane called and wanted to see me at her office. My knees were all spaghetti-like, and I wore my heart down my sleeve. And to my greatest surprise, Jane took it too well. She told me, and I'm quoting, I think you have a great sense of humor. She even offered me to become her own personal assistant, and the big event hostess. And not after a long time, Jane had ruined my promotion happiness. She showered me with paperwork that I had to stay up until one in the morning to get done. And when the big day was finally here and I was getting ready for the event, I got a bit too excited and I went to the office all dressed up. I saw Mark and tried to act as smooth as I could. Well, I tripped over and I ripped off my dress. Jane came out of her office at the same exact moment, and again, she saved my life. She lent me one of her super expensive dresses that I'm sure it cost her a big fortune. And that, my friends, was one mistake that I have totally nailed.